Welcome everyone. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, um, especially for our outside examiner for making the trip over here. And uh, it's with really um, enormous pleasure that I'm here to introduce Margaret Anamak Rudolph in the defense of her dissertation, Indigenous Self-Determination and Co-Production of Knowledge. Margaret has a Bachelor of Science degree from UAF and also a Master of Science in Arctic Engineering. Oh, sorry, her bachelor's is in Civil Engineering, Master's of Science in Arctic Engineering. She has received an NSF Dissertation Improvement Grant for this work. Um, she's been an enormously valued member of our research group. I have learned very much from you, Anamak, as have others in our group. And we appreciate not only the one semester of logistical handling of the research group, but Margaret has really provided us all enormous reading lists and support of other members of the group in many, many ways, which are very much um, appreciated. Um, she, as you may also know, many of you, part, some of you actually participated in the TEK lecture series that she put together with Annika. Um, extremely valuable. Um, the recordings are available online and was a critical turning point in my mind in initiating the dialogue and awareness of co-production of knowledge and indigenous knowledge systems on, around campus. She's been a member of the Food Security Work, Food Sovereignty Working Group. She's a member of the Alaska Native Success Initiative team. And in, in these and many, many ways, she has offered herself and her intellect to IARC and to um, UAF as a whole. I want to acknowledge that in addition to Margaret's great intellect, she, she does all of her work with integrity. She has taken enormous initiative in all of her research and everything she does. She projects a relaxed confidence that um, <laughs> you may or may not see today, but um, it's always a pleasure to have in, in any group. Um, she does her work with humility and with thoughtfulness and intentionality. All, um, and I'm sure you'll notice all of these traits and scholarship in, in her presentation here. Margaret's research is innovative and reflects her commitment to research ethics, equity, and the process of co-production of knowledge, as well as indigenous self-determination. Thank you. <laughs> so I'll get into it. Um, so just providing context, um, I like to show the language map. Alaska. Um, we're on Chapita campus um, in, in the traditional land, the Lower Tana of Diné. And so I really um, like to be reflexive of the diversity of Indigenous people within Alaska in my work. It's not a monoculture. There's a lot of complexity, but that's kind of why I lean into co-production of knowledge as a research approach. Um, I myself, I am Anupia. My Anupiat name is Anamak. My family originally comes from King Island, which is the green circle in the Bering Strait, but I grew up in Fairbanks in an anchorage. Um, so just to provide some context, there's over 20 um, in Alaska native languages within Alaska. Currently, there's 227 federally recognized tribes. Alaska's large, remote, many communities don't have road access, limited connectivity, and is being impacted by climate change. And so that kind of provides a backdrop for why this is different from like the broader literature of co-production of knowledge. A lot of my dissertation, my PhD journey has also been kind of myself and understanding kind of who I am as an indigenous scientist. It's not like two separate people, I'm like one person. And I think one way it links together is values and how I do my research. And that's in part from indigenous methodologies and learning about that and kind of leaning into those things. Um, so it's kind of represented here in this little Venn diagram where I see that as like my whole self and not two separate things. I am both indigenous and a scientist. It's not either or. So co-production knowledge, how I define it is co-producing every step of the research process with your community partners. And so that means co-developing the research questions, the problem statements, the design, the methods, 
doing the methods together, co-analysis, um, doing the dissemination together, all those steps you're doing with your community partner, that's what co-production knowledge is. It is really the shared decision-making, treating your community partners as researchers is what makes co-production knowledge different from other methodologies. Um, there are very similar community engagement methods. Um, I like to look at the four principles of co-production knowledge, Nordstrom's et al. 2020, and they have four principles I think can differentiate it from other community engagement approaches, which co-production needs to be pluralistic, interactive, goal-oriented, Oh no. <laughs> Sorry, we're having technical difficulties in the room. Um, you guys probably can't tell the projector just turned off. Okay, it's back on. The camera might be messed up, but we'll run with it. <laughs> and then um, something to consider again, working with Indigenous contexts is that you really have to think about the context that Indigenous people are in which is the historical and present day colonialism, racism, and systemic inequality. And really you to kind of work in those contexts, you need to respect indigenous knowledge and sovereignty and self-determination. Um, there are five themes kind of throughout my dissertation research. The first one is indigenous self-determination, hence the name of what I called my dissertation. And then the second one is research as colonial acts. Um, perspectives and the need for a shared vision, trust and respect, and the need for more support to do co-production knowledge. These are my four papers in my dissertation. So starting out in the top left corner is um, a, a, like, it's functionally acts as a background chapter, but it's a critical analysis of co-production knowledge as a theory and implementation um, using indigenous critical methodologies. My second paper on the, the top right is a methods paper thinking, um, it's like a how-to literature on co-production knowledge, looking at variables of success, and then also then looking at how different trained research paradigms, I'll explain that later, will create different assumptions and biases within the research process. My third paper, the bottom left, is on the roles of boundary scanners in the context of Alaska Native communities. And then the bottom right, is on Arctic observing and the different perspectives of what success is in Arctic observing. So going into the first paper, so again, this one is the critical analysis of co-production of knowledge in Arctic research. Um, so this starts with indigenous critical methodologies. And so it's really considering the fact that science and, um, sorry, I keep touching this thing up here so it doesn't turn off again. <laughs> um, it, that science and colonialism are somewhat interlinked. During the scientific revolution, you had the end of, end of the monarch rule and imperialism, and that influenced science as we know it today, um, such as with individualism, and also, too, providing justifications for colonialism, such as supremacy in the sense of placing, basically, white men in the position of power and people of color and women in the lesser positions of power. And that was is a fact in the past, but that does have some influences in today and how we think about science as a as superior knowledge, as well as defining power. So who can be a scientist, who cannot? And like really that position again, power that makes it so that way only certain people can define what is true and real in those concepts. And so again, this is a broad field that I wanted to kind of start pulling into co-production knowledge. Um, spaces. And this is critical literature. Most of these are related to Indigenous um, people. So just, just showing them, I'm not going to go into in depth, but it's quite old. 1961 is the oldest. Um, it's a continually growing field today. And then it's somewhat different from Indigenous methodologies. There's quite a lot of overlap, but I like to think of them functionally a bit different. Critical literature methodologies is basically unlearning versus Indigenous methodologies is learning. And indigenous methodologies by definition is, is basically indigenous people looking towards their own traditional ways of how they would do research and working with their own community. And so it's basically simplified like indigenous people, for indigenous people, by indigenous people, um, with indigenous people is basically indigenous methodologies. Um, so 
I can't go into a lot of these concepts. I did give a longer presentation on this in US Shine the Light series. And if you're a fan of Tech Talks, you'd be a fan of this series, so go look it up. Uh, but here are some broad concepts, which is co-opting indigenous knowledges and methodologies, even by accident could happen. Um, when you try even translating indigenous concepts from indigenous words into English, you're inherently changing the meaning. Othering and tokenism, basically not supporting self-determination of indigenous individuals, indigenous people in general. Presenting indigenous people as at-risk people, presenting them as victims is another problem. Not practicing UNDRIP. So UNDRIP is um, the UN Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous People and ethic, the free prior informed consent. Oh, there's this typo there, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and yeah, and so that is a standard within ethics, but where they highlight it somewhat differently is that this consent, it has to be self-directed by the community with no timelines or expectations in an ongoing process. Um, there is a really foundational paper, Tuck and Yang, Decolonization is not a metaphor. They have a concept in there, Settlers Moves to Innocence, um, which highlights several different examples of how, basically how there could be colonial acts within research and in general, broader society. One is claiming naivety, two is claiming spaces meant for Indigenous people, and then three is arguing for equality. I oh, wonder ended with so many typos on side. I'm sorry. Equality over equity. Um, and so kind of shifting gears into looking at co-production knowledge, the theory, there has been a lot of changes within the broader literature of co-production knowledge, not just with indigenous people. And this is kind of highlighted in these two papers that are categorizing co-production knowledge. The first one, Bremer and Niche from 2017, where they categorize it really based on their approaches and their activities. And then Chambers, four years later, then define, categorize co-production knowledge projects based on power and politics, underlying motivations. And I, you know, both have benefits. I do like the Chambers a lot more because then it really helps with clear communication when you're working with partners about what is the purpose of your project. Are you researching solutions? reframing agency, those types of elements. I think that's really kind of great as well as it, again, this kind of shows a four year gap where there's been a lot of fundamental literature on co-production knowledge in the sense of deal addressing power and politics. And then kind of in general, the bigger major criticism about co-production knowledge is that it's aspirational. And when you go to apply during co-production knowledge, there's a lot of challenges. And so this is again the kind of the reality of co-production of knowledge. So the reality is that relationships take time, caretaking, and resources, which can be hard for a researcher to give, but also your community partner might not be able to give as well, which leads to research fatigue, which is a big topic with an Arctic research. Um, you know, the reality is we need to address power and politics, and kind of the consequence of not doing it or doing it a certain way is that if you use conflict avoiding consensus, you can leave out marginalized voices within a project. Um, the reality, diverse perspectives, ideas, and research creates tension. Um, so I like this paper, Love Rent, and kind of the, looking at why projects fail. One is the logic of accountability, where when you put the concept of success into the hands of the users, your community partner, and they disengage or they don't even engage with the first place, the project's a failure. And then similar the logic of ontology, basically when you, again, you have these diverse perspectives, you have indigenous people coming to the discussion table, they're gonna talk about wanting to change the role of science, the processes associated with it. And then that might be difficult for scientists to listen to. So they shut down the conversations around those things. And then again, you have disengagement from your community partners. And then again, the project's a failure. Um, I couldn't talk about co-production knowledge without acknowledging this really foundational example. And so this is the, Xiang Yo, co-production of knowledge, conceptual model. I'm hoping everyone knows what this is. <laughs> uh, it's by Julie Ramina Kubian, Rachel Daniel, and Carolina Behe. And it's really taking into consideration of basically everything I said before and then setting the good example, setting basically talking a lot more about the indigenous methodology side of things instead of the critical side of things and how we actually do co-production knowledge. I think one foundational thing to note is most of the broader literature on co-production knowledge is focused on utilization 
as the cornerstone for all the work you do. And this model of equity, kind of really highlighting needing to address the context Indigenous people live in and thinking about colonization, racism, those elements. And so then kind of shifting gears and looking um, not so much at just the literature, but an actual example of doing critical analysis on navigating the new Arctic, or NNA for short. And so as an example of in implementing co-production knowledge, the call for proposals explicitly state um, encouraging co-production knowledge with Arctic Indigenous communities. And one of the justifications for it is enabling resilient, sustainable Arctic communities. And I'm pretty sure most of everyone knows they've gotten criticism uh, via two open letters from Indigenous leaders from Western Alaska. If you go to that link, you can read the letters yourself. Please do so if you haven't. Um, these are some concepts from those letters that I think are relevant to this paper, which was lack of understanding of what co-production knowledge is, ensuring competency and expertise within researchers, asking NSF to move away from Western approaches to more co-production knowledge and indigenous approaches, building capacity within communities to do research and participate and having um, indigenous representation within NSFs at the program level, as well as within the peer review process. And kind of looking at that and analyzing that from the context of what we talked before about what are colonial acts and research, here are some things which is claiming naivety. So misusing the term co-production knowledge for research that's not actually practicing co-production knowledge. Again, claiming naivety in the sense that these are both co-production knowledge and indigenous methodologies are whole disciplines. And just kind of recognizing that, not taking responsibility is another one in the sense that these people who are misusing co-production knowledge are getting funded anyways. And so the action is really needing appropriate peer review process. Again, recognizing co-production knowledge and indigenous engagement are whole disciplines that you can review from. Another one is othering or having these token roles. So the lack of self-determination um, within the co-production knowledge projects within projects, as well as in the program level in the sense that there was no practice a free prior and informed consent. And in the sense that like with NNA, it created expectations, a time limit for approval. There's a lot of pressure for communities to join on projects, even if they weren't co-production knowledge. And so that's why it's not really following co-production knowledge or not, not really following ethic. And so an action to overcome that is engaging those indigenous leaders at the program level presenting as at risk. And so even in the RFP, the way they talked about it in, with NA, again, the justification is that there's unprecedented risk due to climate change. And again, it should be more language within the call for proposals presenting indigenous people as leaders and not only as victims. Um, so concluding thoughts from this paper that I kind of want to leave with is the sense that this is an analytical critique of NA to understand how to do it better for myself. And I'm sharing it. I consider myself part of the Arctic research community, part of the NNA community. This is not me just like an outsider critiquing. It's definitely, I feel a lot, you know, I really feel like I'm practicing responsibility of how to do better as a scientist. Um, I do think NNA are steps towards the right direction, um, but it's a messy start and lots of learning. And I kind of reflecting on my PhD at this point and writing like the introduction conclusion, is I don't think I could have done my PhD without NNA. Um, there's been a lot of opportunities to observe and discuss, learn, and now I'm just kind of sharing that out. And my last thought on this is what is the purpose of NNA? Is NNA to make societal benefits for Indigenous people, or is NNA just to fund science as usual? And I think having clear communication on that would help have different expectations on different things. And so moving on to my second paper, which is the methods paper on thinking about how we achieve success in co-production knowledge. And so co-production knowledge is about the process. Every project lives in the, in the context of the broader society. And then you have the inputs part of a project before the proposal, then you have once you're funded, the process. And then once the project's towards the end, the outcomes. And so diving in deeper into each one of those things, um, I can't go over every single detail. <laughs> so in the context, you know, you have external factors, funding, 
Um, again, this bringing in the historical and present day colonialism, racism, and systemic inequity, and intrapersonal inside yourself. You know, the readiness to collaborate, accurate train, like training and education, interpersonal, the inner team dynamics. And so being, you know, being able to over, like have good communication and team dynamics to deal with the diverse perspectives that are inherently, that are inherent to co-production knowledge projects. And then kind of form that towards the end of the inputs is the formulation of partnerships and really co-producing it, obviously, building legitimacy and fairness within the process. And then you shift into the process part so practice is like best practices, a story how like ethics, how you conduct your project, um, implementations, the actual research activities. I think one kind of foundational thing that we overlooked a lot in normal, normal research project is social learning that happens within projects. And then outputs are your like tangible products that come out of a project and making sure too that there are products that are accessible to your community partners and useful for them. And then outcomes is like, well, did you achieve your co-defined goals or not? Uh, those are short-term and then long-term you have impacts. And so really co-identifying societal impacts and indicators to assess later. And then in general, not to ask me to shut down, no. <laughs> um, and in the sense, too, it's just like everything you do have your perspective of what success is, and that could impact what you consider your project as success, and making sure you have methods that are culturally responsive when you do your evaluation. Um, so something to consider when you have all those variables, you cannot do all of those within a project. That is like impossible. There's limited resources and time. And so I started looking at different approaches. And so these are research paradigms, which come from more of the broader literature on research design. These are how people are generally trained into certain paradigms. I call them, I kind of develop dispositions within them. So dispositions meaning it creates a box, but not everyone's gonna be in that box because people are different, have different means and ways of being. And so starting with the, the dark two on the left, uh, post-positivist and constructivist, those are two generally based in academia. Post-positivists, um, they do hypothesis testing, focus on scientific outputs. These are generally, vast majority of natural scientists are trained in post-positivist research paradigm. Constructivists are more social scientists. They focus more on the perspectives and capturing them. So inherently they're gonna look at and prioritize the interpersonal part of the project in the beginning, but also has it plays out throughout. Both of these, since they're in academia, what's the standard for reward is peer review publications. And so inherently that sets up who validates success is other researchers and scientists. In the middle gray, pragmatic is a bit of a flexible box in the sense that they're focused on usability. You know, they're making tools, products, reports. They could be part of an agency, academia or, or nonprofit, something along those lines. And kind of depending on where they're sitting has differences on what they consider success. The light blue, the two on the right are community-based researchers for the most part transformative researchers, um, kind of their main motivation to research is social justice. They're looking at creating positive changes in the community. They look towards the community to validate success. Indigenous methodologies, which are introduced earlier, a lot of, when you look at the pattern between it, self-determination is the link um, in how they do their research. And so they look a lot at the intrapersonal, the inside of yourself um, aspect of a proposal. So like the very beginning. So that's kind of why if you engage with Indigenous people, they want to know who you are before they work with you, because that's what they prioritize is the intrapersonal aspect. And again, they look towards the community, self-determination is what they consider success. Um, another aspect I think is relevant um, within the literature co-production knowledge is the concept of knowledge utilization. What makes outputs useful? And so the key three factors that make it is relevance, credibility, and legitimacy. Um, so if you can, if I compare the two post positives and indigenous, so post positives, what is relevant to them is that they're going after funding and then what's considered innovative within that funding. They're also looking to apply their expertise. What's credible to them is the scientific methodology, the peer review process, legitimacy. Another way to say it's like fairness is they're looking at team dynamics to them. Being independent is non-biased. 
versus when you look at indigenous, what's relevant to indigenous partner is community priorities, are you meeting them, the work towards them, indigenous knowledge is what they consider credible. They'll often, again, making sure you're not co-opting or misrepresenting indigenous people when they look at projects about indigenous people, they'll look for indigenous, if it's indigenous led or not, to make sure that um, that kind of outcome is reflective of the indigenous worldview. Legitimacy is quite different in indigenous methodologies and says that basically you look and really understand your, your subjectivity, your biases very deeply. And that's through that avenue, then you become objective, um, as well as having shared decision-making um, and equitable distribution of funds for them to, process, to participate. And so I guess a lot, <laughs> and that kind of plays into a lot of things. This is a methods paper. The goal for this is to really support projects having clear transparent communications within their process is the goal of this paper. Um, moving on to my third paper, which is the looking at the roles of boundary spanners uh, with Alaska Native communities. And so I held a workshop. It was sent, all my methods sent around a two-day workshop. These are the boundary spanners, my co-authors. Um, and then the methods I used to support co-production of knowledge is a convergence method, the embers um, by Deanna Pennington. So that's employing model-based reasoning in synthesis projects. <laughs> and then as well as doing participatory decision-making facilitation in order to get people to really talk about things, get to a shared understanding, and then make decisions on what gets put forth in a paper of what we think the role of boundary standards are. Um, so then going into kind of the results, um, the different themes that we identified, there was a rejection of the term boundary spanners, kind of shown by the slide of you have a person who is a fisherman from a village and they're representing those, those different things and all these different committees, science projects, as well as maintaining the relationship to land and water through subsistence. That's what boundaries are you talking about? And having that kind of focus on boundaries within the terminology was led to pointless conversations is kind of rejecting the term. There was no decision on if there is a better term. I think a lot of people approach it very differently. Um, it's I think kind of what we concluded to versus not a specific box. It's more like a really big box of like different ideas. Um, so yeah, um, there was a lot of shared um, experiences of why they came to the role, a lot of positive experiences, a lot of these words on this page kind of emphasizes that, relationality, feeling through culture, connectivity, all those different things. Um, but a lot of times the role was not sustainable and how they were set up generally by outsiders in the sense that's often a token role predefined, you're being asked to do basically five roles in one, which is like listed on the side there. A lot of people generally go through an identity crisis in the sense that if you're a researcher doing boundary spanning, those aren't typical academic jobs. It's like, how do you fit in academia? How do you get tenure? And also too, if you're not an academic PhD researcher doing this, then kind of the insecurity in the sense of like imposter syndrome and how you participate. Generally the role is undervalued and underpaid. Um, a lot of times people express and needing to clean up other people's messes. Um, to do to get basically project functional. Um, the work is generally uncomfortable because you're basically sitting between two groups and there could be conflict between these two groups. Um, and then there's also kind of building on that the sense that boundary spanners can often enable boundaries because you're being asked to be in the center and then people are talking to you instead of to each other. And really it should be this other thing where you have those different boundaries talking to each other and not going through like this one person. And that's kind of like the systemic change avenue of it. Um, there was discussion how we support the role better. A lot of people um, started their own consulting business because they need the autonomy to self-determine what they want. They're not being held accountable to organizational challenges and barriers. Um, they need recognition. They need to feel valued, get paid well. <laughs> Um, having commitment from both sides to do the works to reduce conflict, 
that this person is having to deal with, having time to orient to the situation instead of getting dropped in and asked to comment or participate right off. And like, you need time to learn what's happening as well as there could be roadmaps built for people to read to start out with. And then having a support system, um, having networks, training mentorships. I think there was a lot of connections made within the workshop. This is the first time a lot of the participants were able to talk about this role in this way and having that empathy and that shared experience is really important. Um, when we started wrapping up the workshop, I had them kind of decide where like two important things we need to put forth. One of them is this concept of kind of like what we see in the in-between. It was the boundary, but people didn't like that. So we kind of shifted the in-between. And in the paper, I started calling them like ourselves as like those in the in-between to kind of capture that sense of like vagueness, but also like functionality, what it is. And basically there was these two things. This is uh, Corey Erickson's lot hit his his ideas in the sense that you have boundaries and what are they and how do we overcome them? And a lot of them are equity-based. So you have the culture of divide, again, the, you know, you have science policy separate from communities and they should be together, as well as gross inequity in funding in the sense that a lot of funding set up to support academia and agencies versus communities cannot get, cannot participate in Arctic research because they don't have infrastructure. They don't have funding to do so. They don't have capacity to do so. So really focusing on getting that, that up so that they can participate in research. Um, mentorship was the other one that came up a lot, really focusing on uplifting the next generation, supporting that as needs of systemic change. And so um, the photo on the right is by Carly Tyans Hassel. And um, just kind of this idea of indigenous leadership, um, that's kind of what the picture is showing as well as the holistic in, um, indigenous approach to doing mentorship. There's also a lot of concepts that a lot of people are hidden leaders, um, encouraging the next generation to engage in tribal councils, other councils, committees, um, having them set up a sense of identity that are indigenous as well as whatever role they're filling um, and also supporting intergenerational, intergenerational learning. Okay, going into my fourth paper. <laughs> This one's about Arctic observing. And so I, I'm not gonna give too much context, this is a lot. Um, so this is about sustaining Arctic observing networks, roadmap or sing on roads. Uh, basically it's about generating societal benefits with emphasis on Arctic indigenous peoples. Um, so I, it's part of our project, um, RNA Cobbs, researching networking activity for stain. Coordinated observations for Arctic change is what RNA COBS is short for, throwing a lot of information, just it's about Arctic observing. <laughs> and then that project's in partnership with the Indigenous led Food Sovereignty Working Group. And so here's kind of everyone involved in this project in these focus groups. Um, you know, we have the list of people in RNA COBS on the left and the Food Sovereignty Working Group, as well as in the center, the people that participate in both. And this I consider collective knowledge, similar like the past paper was collective knowledge everyone involved in the workshop. And so the methods I did for this was a rapid assessment process. That process open-ended, really meant to gain insider's perspective on things. It assumes because it's open-ended that what people contribute is what's most important to them. It's a team-based approach, so that way it creates robustness through the different perspectives and having this iterative convergence analysis how you come to a conclusion. And that's kind of where the robustness comes from in the results. And so with applying that within the project, I did nine homogeneous focus groups who recorded in Zoom, transcribed using Zoom, and they only had one prompt, which was what does success look like in improving Arctic observing? Um, and then the research team was myself, I tried to look representing the sovereignty group, Sandy Stark rather, and Ryan Cody representing RNA co-ops. We each then individually did text analysis using Max QDA, we compared code books and did iterative data representation, like comparing them and deciding changes in them until we came to basically what I'm gonna present here today. And so it came out with these lists of themes of success. Um, I'll zoom in in a second, um, but on the left, you see a list, those are themes of success. And on the right are the different perspectives. Um, it's a Venn diagram. And so on the left is the scientists of RNA co-ops, on the right is indigenous-led food sovereignty group. And again, what's the center is what they both talked about. So zooming in to the top, I cannot go into every little detail, it's a lot of information. Um, <laughs> and 
you know, again, themes, what are the success in improving art and observing is on the left. What I want to focus on to highlight is that one example is what is sustained. And so sustained, what they talk about in common is continuity of long-term funding for observing networks from federal agencies. From, on the RNA side, they talk a lot about federal agencies taking over operations of important observables that need to be observed, as well as climate scale observations. But when you go over to the food sovereignty working group side, what they talked about is how indigenous knowledge systems are inherently an Arctic observing system. And really, it, it's, and then it's sustained. It has been here way before scientific measurements and should continue way on. So really supporting the indigenous way of life, supporting indigenous observing networks, as well as when you're thinking about developing new projects, instead of focusing on the what's, focusing on the how's and really funding um, long-term relationships as a process. Um, and then going to the next part. Um, so this, this part here is the elements of observing system, all this list. Down here, we have the top part is the process of improving. So things that need to be part of the process when we're talking about improving. And then the bottom is the attributes to that process. And so again, not I can't dive into too much. I'm going to focus on what is community engagement. Obviously, since we're talking about societal benefits, community engagement is important. Focusing on developing relationships and then also needing funding to do so was identified by both groups is important. From the food sovereignty working group side, really it being community driven from the bottom up to make the most relevance, um, engaging early before the project starts, following co production knowledge. From the RNA side, it was leaning more towards how they would typically do research, which is using scientific methodologies and mapping requirements, is what they had conceptually going in about how to do the community engagement. Um, within kind of deciding that and looking at the codes, there were several codes that didn't fit in as themes of success because they were really tensions that were identified in the dialogue. So these are like challenges and barriers. And so again, I can't go over all of them. I'm just gonna go over this one, which I thought was kind of really kind of encapsulated even the NMA part, which is ongoing systemic issues, which is from the RNA co-op side, the ability of lists to get community needs and suggestions. So kind of the systematic approach where it's a bit not relational, but a bit more transactional with products versus from the food sovereignty working group side, what they see as systemic ongoing issues is not recognizing power dynamics and the context of colonization. Again, really pushing for co-production knowledge, self-determination, those elements. And so, yeah, we're finally at the end. <laughs> so um, some concluding thoughts. I came working on this um, and just kind of where I've seen a couple of different things. So co-production knowledge is often presented at the end spectrum of community engagement the most, but I think it depends on how you're framing it, where you're framing it. And so this, I'm using triple loop learning. And so if your outcome is indigenous resilience, um, if you do the inner loop, which is action, a single loop routine, where scientists are just researching solutions, generally that would create iterative improvements, which is important, has its rules. Um, but if you zoom out a little bit more to start reframing, um, kind of the, the situation, um, and you do co-production knowledge, that allows a space to start asking, like, are you solving the right problems? Or, you know, instead of focusing on this, researching this solution, you should focus on this, is where co-production knowledge lives. But in general, if you're thinking about indigenous resilience, you go back and you start really questioning the context of where we're basing our decisions off of. So again, recognizing context of colonization, racism, it's really to support indigenous resilience, you need to support indigenous self-determination. You know, there needs to not be reliance on outsiders to meet their needs is ultimately what is indigenous resilience. Again, the key themes played throughout indigenous self-determination, um, research as colonial acts and how it kind of played into all three um, perspectives and the need for shared vision. Trust and respect um, was something talked about a lot in meeting. And then in general too, more support to do co-production knowledge, including like capacity building, funding to relationship building, those elements. Um, these are my lessons learned. <laughs> um, so it's pretty odd to do co-production knowledge as a PhD because you have to meet individual scientific rigor 
prove I can get my PhD. I tried to practice co-production knowledge as closely as possible. Um, kind of the way I did that with my committee decisions, I read write the articles. Um, and I, only one project I think really met also the terms of co-production knowledge, which is the boundary standards project. The observing project, I couldn't really do co-analysis in a practical way. I, we did iterative feedback cycles, but I couldn't do actual co-analysis. There was just too many people involved in timing and everything. One big aha I had was that you do not need to validate everything in the sense that theory verification is one way to do research. This is generally post positive paradigm, um, but you don't have to do it all the time. It's, you could do it for certain purposes. So like, you know, for doing the boundary standards project, that wasn't theory verification. Like I didn't have a hypothesis I went and tested. I, you know, it was more of a constructivist type of approach. Um, in order to do co-production knowledge, how you get a co-production knowledge starting is networking, this informal aspect of research refinement. And so really having open conversations with people as you build con like projects, um, having, yeah, just networking, like how you network with other researchers, talk about ideas and not have everything be formal when you do community engagement, um, as well as generally you should go to conferences where there are indigenous people is a good way to start co-production knowledge projects. Um, one thing that Adelaide Herman, Dr. Adelaide Herman talks about a lot is go slow to go fast in the sense that you really need to put in time so those inputs part of the project, building relationships, trust, or else if you rush through that too quickly, um, you'll end up having tensions during the process phase and you'll have to backtrack within the project in order to deal with that and then move forward in a good way. And so thank you. These are my funders. Thank you, funders. <laughs> um, so thanks to my co-authors, my collaborators, uh, my committee members. I have lots of mentors that aren't just like named here. And I think a lot of people I consider also peer mentors. So yeah, thank you. Um, well, I guess, do we want to open it up for co-authors to comment first? And I can also look if there is a co-author online. You can raise your hand. There's, um, yeah, that's a good way of doing it. Co-author online, raise your hand. If you don't have any questions yet in the chat, but please add your questions and we can read those out. So. All right. So. Any, any, anything from co-authors? There's several of you. No, nothing? Okay, I guess then, yeah, question. And if you're online, questions on the chat, please. Good job, Margaret. Uh, Andy. So you can go first. Or Jessica, he's asking you to go first. More of a applied high school question. How did you plan to get your results, your conclusions out to the people that you I mean, yeah, you know, that you can hear it? I've been debating and um I was talking to um Kina a bit about it, and I was just thinking like some aspects, like obviously I'm doing an article, it's gonna get published, you'll see it year, year and a half, you know, publication times. <laughs> um, but I think for more of the broader audience, I was going to create like plain language um, type reports that are more digestible about concepts, um, as well as I've been toying with the idea of making like short videos to share on some of the concepts that it's a bit more digestible to people um, who aren't academics about some of these things. Um, we do have one online. Yeah, but I think we can go to Andy and then I'll go online because I saw that before I saw you. That was a great presentation, Margaret. Once again, um, I'm really glad to come to you. Um, one thing I think you really showed is what is your product? Um, do you have any suggestions for one thing I'm afraid of is 
you're setting a really high bar here, which is a good thing. I think what is the some people may see it as unachievable, and as a result, you know, is there a Co-production not done quite right, better than that Yeah, I think so. I think that's where, you know, my research on co-production knowledge, it is to push the boundaries of what is co-production knowledge. Obviously it is like the bar, but the bar is not something you pass. It's like, you know, pushing the field forward type idea and not like you do it and not, like I said, one of the projects I tried to do co-production knowledge and one I'm observing, but functionally I could not do co-analysis. It would have been too hard. But I followed it as closely as I can and I came out with results that are pretty useful by, by spending time to understand the situation, what are different the different groups wanting, what are different individuals wanting out of like a project, and then developing based on that. And then online there was a there's one online that says, <clears throat> are there some creative examples or concepts, frameworks from other Arctic nations or non-Arctic ones? <laughs> um, I think there are. I think <laughs> I think I could share with you, Tom, a couple papers I think would be a good way. I kind of listed some on there that I think are really good. Um, Esther Turnhout is a great paper um, within Alaska. Elizabeth Figgis's paper on her work with PIC is a really great example um, of co-production knowledge. Um, so yeah, there's a lot. You can make a list and put on a website at some point. And then there's another one. There's another one. Bio um, asked, he's had a great presentation. And he asked, would would be great to get your take on Lauren Devine's <laughs> whoop, it just went. <laughs> Lauren Devine's question. Speak more about where you see this going uh, in the UA system. Uh, you know. <laughs> I guess I mean within the UA system, just again talking to you guys, I feel like we are building um, a community of practice here in that sense. Um, there's the new ESS program which has some of those elements of co-production knowledge. I think Sarah teaches about co-production knowledge um, and keeping up to date always, which I always appreciate <laughs> on things. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunities um, within this. Um, I don't have any specifics yet. And then I saw um, Eric's, I saw your name. Yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> A great presentation, I really enjoyed it. Um, I guess I think it goes kind of back to the end question too. You know, like in like in my perspective, I think I'm really interested in, in enjoying the co production of knowledge um way because I think it's amazing. And um as always, like that presentation like the US kind of blow my mind as the Western scientist. Um but I can also tell that it's extremely hard. And so like I made a commitment to myself that I want to do it the right way now, but then sometimes I still see myself like getting on things that are probably the wrong way still, just because, you know, science is going in such a fast pace and, and for production of knowledge takes time. As I said, it's funding to like get the point where you can actually write the proposal, get them the, the, the research funded. And so I guess my question is, you know, what, what is your advice for people coming from like very, I don't know, mechanistic science driven <laughs> <laughs> worlds to, to make that right turn? Because I think that's where we have to go in the Arctic, but it's, you know, you might need some advice to get there. It is no case in there. Yeah. Um, I think kind of those, those part of the lessons learned I had was in the sense that you don't have to go in like, with a solid like proposal, everything pre-done, that's not co-production knowledge. If you want to start, I think a good way to start is start going to conferences where there is a lot of indigenous people, um, like Alaska Forum and the Environment, Alaska Tribal um, Conference on Environmental Management is another one. Um, yeah, and just start making connections, start understanding, you know, if you work in a certain area of Alaska, start looking towards those communities, what are they having out there? And just start networking and building a project. Again, that's like banking, that's a long-term thing. Um, 
and it's just it's going to take a long time for you to do it versus i think like trying to shortcut that by getting a project going right now real fast is like not the way to do co-production knowledge and so just investing in time to learning the situation and then um thank you that's good, great yes david dominique chavez is great i'd recommend that tom um she has a great paper i cite a lot and then she also says um, the argument seems to be ahead yes. of the curve on co-production of knowledge. Any thoughts on this? What factors do you think can help in the argument? I think it's interesting dynamic. I think in a lot of ways, because of NNA, it's forced this dialogue and conversation um, in co-production knowledge. I do think it's true. Um, in some way, balancing that out in understanding kind of who I am as like indigenous scientists, the scholarship around indigenous engagement, there's a lot coming out of Laura 48, particularly in association with Arizona, both of the big campuses there. <laughs> um, just a lot of papers coming out of there. And so I looked at them when I was really developing a lot of these ideas and not just looking at co-production knowledge because that's very Western and coming from that aspect of indigenous engagement from, from these scholars like Dominique David Chavez is a great example of someone I look to a lot. Um, there's also another one here, lovely, meaningful work, Margaret. Um, as we think about the co-producing knowledge, does the storytelling factor into the work? And if so, how? Yeah, I think it, it it's to me very contextual. Um, when I did the Boundary Spanners project, I opened it to people sharing stories. Um, there was some, it wasn't, since a lot of them are research professionals, it wasn't totally only that. A lot of people have that functional, pro productive mindset researchers have. Um, I think, it, yeah, it just depends on the situation, who's involved, what makes the most sense for that situation, whether you do storytelling as an actual methodology or not. It could be part of co-production. Oh, um, I'm going to read that back and also copy this. Excellent. Um, uh, can you lean back to this? Coming back to the point that you talked about, so um, that you presented also the uh, advice that you make that work better, that you can explain to the folks who find themselves that you can break down the boundaries and the boundary standards, but for the folks who find themselves, as people, what is it? What can those folks do when they find themselves in those situations? Situations to move to, you know, effectively put themselves out of their mouth to try and be such that they're not necessary in the first place. Right. I think a lot of it was this <laughs> element, um, as well as the mentorship. I think a lot of those really fed into kind of working yourself out of the job. Because I honestly do think this role is temporary to get things started. It's functional. It, it's not something you maintain long term. And so you really, one way to look at boundaries banners, this is also from the broader literature. Some people talk about the sense of, sense of like building connections between people is a good way to do that, um, as well as, again, supporting them to do better, <laughs> have their own responsibility and accountability, learning themselves. Um, and then as well as like the mentorship, building capacity within the community so they can do their own work. It's not relying on you forever. It's supporting that indigenous self-determination aspect. Um, so can you share your perspective about how, be how best approaches to co-production of knowledge and co-production of education resources? Education resources, that's very specific. Okay, I think in that sense, um, I, I, when I started got, getting down, like interested in co-production, it was actually in the context of teaching. I think there's an element, the resources where I have like this tension in, in the sense that indigenous knowledge and education is experiential and relational. And sometimes like 
it's good to have those resources because you know functionally where we're at there could be knowledge loss but i think ultimately it's better to support actual intergenerational learning in real life and not putting documentation in place there could be an element where it's self-gathering that documentation is a good way to look at it too um uh, cultural atlases Siku is my committee member is a great example um story maps those types of things where you have community actually doing that like you could be part of that project but i think the more you could support the next generation learning directly from the knowledge holders the better and then i saw a sequel had his hand up and i guess alex can. no oh it's alex <laughs> it was just uh, in front of the sequel yes um, nice job. Nice yeah. presentation. Super compelling. I love the pictures of um, Kimmer's Field. I recognize the, that walk that you and he did. And I I'll recall just witnessing your journey um, over the last couple of years, and it's, it's moving to see the picture and how um, it's wonderful to see. Um, I have a question for you about the word undisciplinary, which it didn't come up a lot in the presentation, but does come up in the presentation. And, um, could you talk about that word and distinguish it between, you know, people like to talk about the disciplinary, the transdisciplinary, the people that are undisciplinary, you hear a lot of things you're saying, um, and it's clearly operative for you. Um, what is its importance when it comes to the public education? Yeah, and so you're referencing, um, so I'm an university PhD candidate, degrees in university. So what is interesting to me? And then there was a paper I actually read in um, Sarah's class called in Undisciplinarity um, by Peter et al. Um, it's a great paper about like how you navigate being on like interdisciplinary. Basically, you kind of write like there's a lot of concepts around that if you're interdisciplinary, you just have like multiple disciplines, but no, that's multidisciplinary. Interdisciplinary is where you kind of let go of this idea that you are interdisciplinary completely. And you kind of approach going into every situation by assessing the situation and like being very self-aware in the sense of like, when I started working on Arctic observing is a great example. When I started working on Arctic observing, like I have a background in permafrost engineering, like I knew how to do climate science. I didn't know the context of who are the major players, major organizations, I had no idea what SAM was, nor the ROSE process, the history behind it, all those elements. And so I had to sit there and be self-aware be like, I don't know this, but I can learn it and therefore I can do it. I also knew, had um, another concept to look at is like methodological groundedness. Are you aware of how to do certain methods within that situation that's relevant to them? And so I knew engaging between the indigenous led food sovereignty group and RNA co-ops, like how do you kind of navigate between what two would think of valid research. And that's kind of where I chose um, the rapid assessment process, acknowledging, you know, really wanting to lead into Sandy Starkweather as a co-author, co-researcher with her vast expertise in Arctic observing, being able to lean on Craig with his expertise on like food sovereignty and um, subsistence and those elements, um, leaning on um, Ryan Cody, who's the other researcher, because he's really the practical GIS analyst. <laughs> and so he has that perspective. It was the first time him doing social research. So he had some of the learning curve. He learned a lot, but he also had that a lot of perspective I wouldn't have picked up on um, in listening to other scientists who are just like him talking. Um, and then you just kind of see that through every stage that you just kind of go into every situation and be like, assess the situation and then decide how to best approach is kind of undisciplinary. Um, so I think Okay. Thank you very much, Margaret.